again, I apologise for the delays and I hope uh, for a number of you, uh, I apologise that you've um, had this um, delay, but I just was interrupted, so I'm sorry for that. Okay, so in terms of the um, canons of positive law, what you'll see is that there are a number of, of important updates in, in the section and the, the updates that I think are important that I'd like to cover now, getting back on track now, is section five, which deals with the issues around occurrence and the principles of occurrence. And by occurrence, we mean things like um, the structure of events that is a very ancient understanding that when one deals with court, when one deals with uh, any type of offence, when one deals with controversy, the reenactment of events is deemed a drama. And our ancestors, thousands and thousands of years ago, the reason they made uh, very little distinction between the entertainment of drama and in fact the actual a holding of court is that in both instances we are dealing with a recreation and because we're dealing with a recreation we are dealing with a fiction. Now I know many of you and, and I certainly also had the dif difficulty of understanding how court could quite happily deal with all these different variations of fiction, how courts could uh, use words like uh, dramatis personae for the cast of characters why they'd use the word party, spectator, actor, why we would find littered throughout uh, the dealing with the law, Shakespeare, and this seeming uh, lack of a veil between uh, the fiction of entertainment uh, and the fact that when we go to court, we may be fighting for our own life. Well, that in fact is our ignorance, not uh, the fault of the court in understanding that drama, whether it be a recreation of a fictional event, a recreation of a historical event, or the recreation of an event uh, because uh, a matter is being resolved, are all forms of fiction. So I hope that helps you because we then get a better understanding of exactly what we mean when we talk about an instance, an occurrence, a drama, a scene, a party, a spectator, protagonist, antagonist, a plot and a motive. And that's all under section 5.1 of occurrence. And then when you look at the another, another area of updating in terms of the positive law, we speak about fact and what we mean by fact and its method and its source and its reference. And then we deal with a, a third section there in, in terms of the aspect of evidence. Now another area, another very, very important area, is the area of argument. And the area of argument has been, I know, a, a major area of concern for a number of you uh, and, and also for me when you look at the question of why do the courts ignore uh, documents? Why do, does a court uh, ignore uh, objections? How does a court get away with uh, the uh, way that they deal with uh, the presentations and material that we put in. So on that, when we talk about argument, uh, what you see is that we introduce a range of different uh, sections, such as the principles, where are we? The principle of argument in terms of logic and dialectic and rhetoric. Now, a court case, any court case, any controversy, functions and operates on principles of logic and principles of dialectic. And when we speak, wherever we speak, we are dealing on principles of rhetoric. Now these are principles and rules that are normally uh, not given to us. So that when we go to court, we don't see Uh, that the, the uh, rules are in fact, I just want to check here, I'm sorry we've had a, a number of technical problems. Uh, can, you, can people hear me still? I know that a number of you seem to have lost audio. Can people hear me on audio? Please let me know if you can. Great, thank you very much. Okay. 
one of the hardest things to understand is how a court can dismiss uh, a, a claim, uh, an appeal, when so much work has been put into that. It seems uh, cruel uh, to us, and yet there is a reason and a way that they do it. And they use it in terms of logic. They use it in terms of dialectic. In other words, when you put forward a case and you throw everything in the kitchen sink in that case, and two or three points in that case include claims that are unsubstantiated or are far out there, all the judge needs to do and all a prosecutor needs to do is pick the one thing that you put in there that was weak and use that as an argument that all of it's weak and so, the, so that the objection, the claim, the countersuit can be thrown out. And that is using logic. So unless we know the tools by which the very, very best of the bar used to defeat us, there is no way that we will be able to uh, deal and handle ourselves better. So I give you these areas because they are in fact a fundamental part of law, even if they've been no longer taught. Rhetoric used to be taught. It used to be taught as one of the fundamental areas like mathematics. Rhetoric, mathematics, these were considered key aspects of education and they were removed. Why? because they did not want people to know how to argue, how to defend themselves, how to stand up for themselves. So I, I do hope that you will see these things and read these things and see that they are very important principles. Now the other area that has been updated and a major, major area that's being updated is the area of law. And in the area of law, we have a whole range of new sections. And I noticed that um, uh, in the notes here that the index is slightly corrupted in terms of the listing of these. But under law, we've included now a range of sections, not only in terms of the virtues of law, which were there before, but extended through to uh, the uh, principles of law. And we've also included... Uh, in, in terms of updates, in terms of the uh, authorities of law. Unfortunately, as I look at this index, I notice that the index doesn't reflect the changes to Section 7. So uh, this is something that I'll need to cover next week, and hopefully we'll have better audio and, and less distractions next week in terms of the discussion on principles of law. But the principles of law are important and I'm seeing if I can in fact update this index as I speak to you so that we can get onto it because it is vitally important. I am going to try and update this index of positive law so I can speak to you on these points in the last few minutes. I'm just trying to upload this document now to see that it works and if it works then we can get on to refreshing the page and seeing the index. Okay. So I've just refreshed that page. Excellent. And that page has been refreshed. I can now ask those that are on the call and those that will be listening later to go and have a look at the index and you'll see the updating to the section in terms of principles of law. So in the, in the minutes remaining, I just want to cover some key things in additions to principles of law, things that we missed before. Of course, we'd spoken in the past about freedom and we'd spoken about rights and privileges we'd spoken about equity and slavery and culpability we hadn't covered properly of course the two areas of mens re and actus reus uh, being guilty of mind and guilt, guilty of body these are important elements um, that were missed counsel is important so article 229 in terms of counsel the right to counsel but the right to independent counsel is extremely important and so here we see a clarity in terms of what we mean by counsel and the concept of independent counsel and including there of course the definitions of what is a lawyer what is an attorney what is a barrister uh, so that we can be clear in terms of what we mean by what is independent counsel and in terms of those terms what is counsel that cannot be independent of course, a lawyer cannot be independent because the meaning of the word lawyer 
comes from two words, la, lares, and euro, urare, which means to swear and take an oath. <laughs> so a lawyer is one who's sworn an oath to customary law or the law of the guild. So a lawyer can never, by definition, be an independent counsel. Why? Because they've sworn a solemn oath to the bar. That's what a lawyer is. And of course, then on Article 230, we covered in a very important area in terms of pro se, the concept of uh, being your own counsel. And the language is important. Remember, they trick us all the time in terms of language. They trick us to use the word representation or representation. We don't represent. We present. We attend. We visit. And pro se is a very important term that we'll be working on later in defining what we mean exactly by pro se. So pro se is covered there. And later we'll be refining this when we speak of specific ways that we will present ourselves pro se. Not just pro se in essay, which is pro se in existence, but also pro se as the tribunal of persons. And we will say that to them. We'll be pro se in terms of um, uh, triplex personum. It's not yet perfected, but it will be a, a statement making clear that when we present ourselves, we present as three superior persons, not simply uh, on the assumption that we present ourselves as surety to their Roman person. Now, in the other uh, areas of, of important rights that we include in there uh, that we haven't co covered before uh, is um, res accusatio, which is the principle of law that once you've been charged with an offence, that you must be given immediate facts of the offence. We include also res judicata, otherwise known as double jeopardy, or the preclusion of claim. You can't be charged, uh, can't be heard, a court case can't be concluded on, on the same matter twice. And we also include the principle of uh, jus propere, which is the, the principle of um, prompt justice. And the principle, of course, of meritus formulae, which is due process and the importance of due process. And in fact, uh, when due process is failed three times, that the law dissolves and that all office or any authorities uh, that are under the law dissolve as well. So these are important uh, rights and principles that were not clear to find previously. And unfortunately, I've run out of time in the finalization of those in terms of having that already, including the area of demurra and allocution. And I've mentioned allocution before, and I've said to you that we would cover allocution. But while I can't get into Article 237 because it's not ready yet in terms of allocution, what I would like you to have a look at, if you are on the, uh, if you have a moment, is if you go and have a look at Article 201, in terms of epilogue under rhetoric, you'll actually see a reference to an origin of elocution in Canon 2682. If you have a look there, you'll see in Canon 2682, the word epilogue or ad locution is the fourth of seven types of rhetoric as a form of speech characterized as occurring at the audience at the conclusion of an event. And Canon 2684 gives you the background. Adlocution comes from the Latin adlocutio, meaning concluding speech, inspired final words, final speech of a play, formal address of an emperor or general. And it's derived from two Latin words, meaning ad, towards, until, up to, and lucur, meaning speech. So if one wants to think about the history of allocution, well, I can't cover this for